Okay. Um, so I'm Seth Kisengo. I uh, teach in the Department of Brain Affairs at the University of Rhode Island. Um, I got into this because years ago, I dropped out of college to go crab fishing in Alaska. So this was way before that stupid TV show. Uh, and uh, one evening in, uh, in Kodiak, Alaska, I went down to a meeting at Fisherman's Hall, and there was an economist from the University of Washington School of Marine Affairs who had flown into town to explain a new system to the fishermen. Uh, it was a proposal for what they were going to do in the halibut fishery, and it's what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight, and that was in 1980, and it was standing room only, and I was standing next to one of the best halibut fishermen in town, and he listened to this proposal to privatize the fishery, and he said, well, that's not fishing. <laughs> and he also said, well, what would happen to the crew? Um, he would have been made a millionaire out of this system, and I'll explain it a little bit later in my talk. And it always stuck with me that this guy, you know, what propelled the guy turned down three millions from the government. And then I sort of switched my focus away from uh, art history to uh, fisheries policy. Anyway, I, I will touch a little bit on what was mentioned previously, but I framed my talk around the subtitle for tonight's session, which is what I, I put up there. Um, so I saw some hands up about Center for Popular Economics. I hope there's some people that are actually affiliated with uh, UMass Amherst Department of Econ. Uh, shameless promotion here. Uh, invite me back for a longer talk. Um, <laughs> but I think that, that economics really has uh, a lot of sins sort of to own up to in, in the world of, of uh, fisheries policy. OK, so I, are, are there any fish junkies in the crowd here? <laughs> All right, but the rest of you aren't. So I sort of assumed that. Um, what are the major challenges that we hear in daily sort of news about uh, the world's oceans? And I've listed some here. And I say, well, I think it's, that's wrong. Not that those things on that list I just showed you aren't substantial challenges, but what's so conspicuous here is what's not on that list and what's missing. And what nobody really is talking about uh, in the world. And that's this. This is the cover of a book from MIT Press by one of the world's most well-known fisheries economists. Um, the title says it all. And I like to call this stealing the oceans to save them, but trust me, uh, the leading prescription for how to save fisheries around the world is to privatize them. And I, I simply can't cover that in 15 minutes, but there's not a major environmental organization in the U.S. that in some form or another is not uh, promoting privatization. Most of the philanthropic foundations, and I'll show you a little bit later on that, are, are uh, promoting that. Here's a, there was a very pivotal paper published in 2008 in the journal Science. This isn't that paper, but this is, the journal Science has its own sort of fluff pieces in the middle of the journal to sort of pump up and pimp the articles. That's the headline of the fluff piece. Uh, supposedly it's been proven that privatization prevents collapse. The same um, article uh, being featured in the British uh, magazine, The Economist, scientists find proof that privatizing will work. And then here's our own New York Times. Uh, the date there is April 8, 2009. And they're quoting uh, Jane Luchenko, who was uh, the head of the NOAA, the National Oceanic and Atmospheric Administration, under President Obama, saying that the U.S. is taking preliminary steps towards privatizing fisheries in New England. So these are not my words, these are the words of the people themselves that are doing it. Uh, and of course, economists are often accused of, yes? What does it mean to privatize a fishery? Hang on. Okay. Get to it, okay? Um, economists, one of the jokes about economists is, is if all you have is a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail. Mm -hmm. So privatizing is a solution, right? Well, maybe you ought to privatize everything, including whales. And that's sort of a fluff piece, but here's the serious piece, right? A market approach to saving the whales. Uh, recent developments in the push for privatization. The World Bank two years ago started something called the Global Partnership for Oceans, the GPO. 
that has already collapsed because of the sort of illogic of, of this argument. But they moved on to something, uh, a program under the GEF, the Global Environmental uh, Facility, so they're not really out of the game. Uh, this is a new report that came out last summer from Environmental Defense Fund, EDF, down there, the logo on the left, and then the, uh, an arm of the Prince Charles Charitable Trust. So Prince Charles is in the game. Uh, towards investment in sustainable fisheries, but the first chapter uh, is the one that's the most, most interesting. Introducing fisheries as investable propositions. We're now openly talking about getting Wall Street into fisheries to save them. And here's the most recent. <laughs> Fish as carbon credits. So when you're talking about the things you're talking about with industrial agriculture, now we're going to use the commodification of fish, the financialization of fish resources, to be part of the global carbon game. Okay, how did we get here? And this is going to get to this question of, well, how do you do that? And this is where this really is the, the, the fault, the blame, the property of fisheries economics. Here's a quote from uh, Parsimal Coach, a very famous Canadian fisheries economist, saying from the start, from the start is a single paper in 1954 by H. Scott Gordon, where economists said, oh, the problem is nobody owns the fisheries. So here's two American economists writing for the government. Uh, the major source of overfishing is the lack of property rights. Now, this is nonsense. The source of overfishing <coughs> is overfishing. Yeah. If you're killing too many fish, kill fewer fish. But if that's the diagnosis, then the prescription is quite automatic, quite clear. This is Ragnar Arneson uh, from the University of Iceland. It follows immediately that the problem would disappear if only you could institute the right property rights. So how do you do that? And the first thing that economists came up with was licenses, license limitation, they call it. That's sort of like taxicab medallions in Manhattan, or oftentimes liquor store licenses. It's a fixed number of licenses, and no more are issued, and you buy and sell and trade those. The problem with that is catch is still competitively determined. So then they came up with something called the individual transferable quota. And that's like stock shares for a fishery, right? Now, there's many names for these around the world. I've put some of them up there. The European term that was introduced uh, recently in the reform of their common fisheries policy is transferable fishing concessions. Myself and another author, we tried to get away from all of the property rights dogma, so we actually came up with the phrase uh, catch shares, and it's all lumped under this term rights-based fishing. What's the real problem here? The real problem is a bunch of people out fishing, racing each other to try and catch as much as they can, or even as much as they can of an overall amount. That's a very simple problem, right? And it's all been obfuscated by a lot of confusion about open access versus common property and ownership versus management. The simple tool here is to take an overall catch and divide it up and pre-assign it to people so they don't go out and race. That's the tool. Okay? Now, the problem here is when you fail to distinguish the tool from the ideology. The tool is just pre-assigned catch. Just think of timber harvest on public lands. You don't let the timber companies go out and just cut as much as they want. You pre-assign them how much they're going to cut. But the insistence that this tool only works as if, if it's private property and that's where you get what I call the privatization model. And the privatization model is characterized by these features. You pre-assign catch, but you actually give it to people as a marketable commodity. It's based on their past performance. It's indefinite, which means it lasts forever. It's fully transferable. They can now sell it and lease it. Um, and it's given to them free. And it's wrapped up in a rhetoric of deregulation of property rights. And it's predicated upon trickle-down economic theories. Okay. All of that. How is it supposed to work? This is the ultimate appeal to uh, self-interest. If you own something, you'll take care of it. <laughs> Don't, I, mean, I can show you the quotes, I just don't have time, but that's it. All right? 
Um, and then I put this parenthetical in there, and there's just ubiquitous invocations of Hardin's tragedy of the commons thesis. And no recognition that even Hardin later corrected himself. Why does this matter? There's important policy options that are being forced off the table. There's many ways you could do this pre-assigned catch. Public leasing. We don't just give away rights to the Grand Canyon to people that sold hot dogs on the South Rim. Right? We don't give away offshore oil and gas. We don't give away timber on public lands. We do some version of pre-assigned harvest, and then we just publicly lease it. But in fisheries, if you go to a graduate program anywhere in the world, you're going to be taught that the problem is they don't have private property rights, and that the only way to get the industry to go along with this is give it to them. Right? Management doesn't equal ownership. What are we talking about here? This is a very famous book. It's from the mid-80s. Every once in a while, the fishers and economists of the world get together for a religious revival festival. And they all <laughs> deliver the same talks to each other that they've all delivered at the last revival festival. <laughs> this was one of the first ones. And in the introduction to this, that's the, the quote at the top. Now look at what these people say themselves. First, they're really talking about an enclosure movement as if it's a wonderful thing, right? Makes you wonder if they know any history of the original English enclosure movement. <laughs> but secondly, these are now mostly the exclusive property of the coastal states of the world. The second block of text, this is our own uh, system here in the United States, the Gulf of Mexico Fishery Management Council did one of these programs. Look what they said they were doing. They're conveying a share of a common property resource belonging to all of us into private ownership forever. Free of charge. How many of you know about this? Okay. This is the leading prescription around the world. It's happening. It's happening under the current administration. What's your answer? Theft. Theft. Or? <laughs> because these programs are designed, I don't have time to show you the quote from a Danish architect of one of the systems where he says, we are deliberately trying to get rid of the small boats <laughs> and celebrate the concentration of the industry, okay? Accumulation by dispossession. For whom? What are we not talking about here? All those words that were in the title, equity, justice, right? And this was, I gave a talk in uh, Cambodia recently at a, at a food and agricultural organization they had uh, an event that was the latest of these revival festivals. I asked them this question. There was, of course, no answer. But that's what we we're talking about. Bringing Wall Street in and kicking peasants out. And we say we're doing this to save the fisheries and to provide poverty alleviation. All right, the last part of the talk, real quickly. Uh, this is sort of the Butch Cassidy and the Sundance Kid question. You know, who are those guys? Here's a partial list, just partial. Gordy Benny Moore Foundation, that's Intel, right? The chip maker. The Bradley Foundation, the Walker Foundation. If you're interested in this stuff, write the names down and Google them. You'll find some really interesting statements about who they are. Uh, the Walton Family Fund, that's Walmart. The Perk Center, any of you that work on public lands probably know the Perk Center out in Bozeman, Montana. That used to be something that we sort of laughed about. Now they're mainstream, and they're especially mainstream in fisheries policy that great fishing state of uh, Montana. Uh, Environmental Defense Fund, and then uh, I singled out the University of California, Santa Barbara, for their special role in all of this. Uh, this one is interesting. This was a number of years ago, and it's no longer on the web, but we've got the web archive. It was called IF, uh, let's see, IFQs for Fisheries, I think is how you find it. And there was this joint project between um, Perk and the Reason Foundation and Environmental Defense Fund. Um, but it was interesting who provides the funding, right? There's the Walker Trust, mm -hmm. the Bradley Fund. Oh, the Koch brothers. Mm -hmm. And you can find all this. This is not, this is, this is Walton's annual uh, grant reports, okay? 2012. Um, the 2012 grant report, let's see what they did. Um, here it is in the center of the screen there. Catch shares is that name. The total in a single year, $10 million. 
$10 million to promote this privatization, 7.8. Let's round it up. That's $8 million to Environmental Defense Fund. Just to pr promote that, 2013, here's the next year grant report. What's the catch share total? Again, 10, almost $11 million. That's just one of these foundations. Uh, the irony is pile up here. That is Catherine Murdoch giving a speech at a food conference in Stockholm, Sweden last year. And if you go a little bit further on, occasionally it shows up that she's affiliated with Environmental Defense Fund. So I looked it up. I couldn't find Catherine Murdoch on their staff. Oh, I found her on their board. Hmm. Do you know who Catherine Murdoch is? She's the wife of James Murdoch. Rupert's son? <laughs> James Murdoch, who used to be the editor of The Sun until they had that little phone hacking scandal. So this is the 1% teaching the world about the benefits of privatization of fishery resources. Uh, the language is, is really worth paying attention to. This is Small Potatoes, right? The Oak Foundation, a fairly progressive foundation, giving 600000 to Environmental Defense Fund to do this in Belize. They will work to create a permanent, irreversible policy for rights-based fishing. Now, I, my standard joke in talks like this is, I didn't think you could use the word permanent and irreversible and policy in the same sentence. <laughs> <laughs> the Reason Foundation, who are they? Well, they want to promote uh, freedom and uh, libertarian principles. Um, they also produce a, a magazine, a journal called Privatization Watch, uh, a project of the Reason Foundation, the world leader in privatization. And then, since this was supposed to have some tie into climate change, you know, sort of like Garrison Keillor, you go off on one of these things and you come back around and look back. This was the best I could do. Uh, back when they were doing that project that was funded by the Koch brothers, I don't know if the guy's still there, but at that point uh, in time, Reason Foundation's science correspondent was this guy who, among other uh, plaudits to his name, was he was the author of Global Warming and Other Eco-Myths. Okay, now these are the groups that Environmental Defense Fund is cavorting with. Right. Uh, this is all occurring under sort of an aura of what I call privatizer parish. Here is something that Pew put out. One last chance for New England's fisheries. We don't have any other options. So, I always close with Delacroix's famous painting of Lady EDF uh, leading the people uh, to save the fisheries through privatization. I mean, this is all very sort of heady, euphoric stuff. Uh, and so, my question is, you're going to achieve justice, equity, and sustainability from economics? Not the economics that they're practicing in resource econ departments around the globe. And we have to have a serious conversation about how to restructure uh, those kinds of programs. Okay, I'm done. Thanks. Mm -hmm.